Welcome to the EQFit Podcast. Our mission is to equip people to prosper in every aspect of their life. Whether you're at home or in the workplace, we explore practical ways of improving success, satisfaction, finding balance, and building enjoyable and beneficial relationships. Thank you for joining us. There's an interesting phenomenon happening right now. I've observed that the sense of urgency to get things done appears to be diminishing. Now, granted, this is only over all of my clients and and other people, business owners, business leaders that I talk to, but there seems to be a significant reduction in the amount of what I call healthy urgency. And don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about panic or anxiety or stress or fear. Those are negative forms of urgency. They drive urgency, sure. And it doesn't mean that they're always bad. I'm talking about that healthy urgency that brings uh, problem resolution, good decision-making, accomplishments, innovation. Do you see the same thing that I do? If you look around, you'll see different people with very different ideas on getting things done. Now, some of that is a personality type issue. What do I mean by that? Well, if you know what a DISC assessment is, and there's a lot of personality assessments out there. As a matter of fact, most of the assessments on the market today are based in personality characteristics. Uh, so, for instance, a high D or, or dominance individual, uh, they're driven. They have an internal clock that runs at a high speed. So when we think about getting things done, they're driving, they're pushing. That clock is ticking. Then there's the high I. That's the influence or inclusion person uh, who really is focused on people, on innovating, creating new things, trying different ways of doing things. Then you've got the high S or steadiness person. They're focused on the task at hand. They want to complete one task before moving on to the next. They want to take a measured approach and pace to getting things done. Then you have the high C individual, which is compliance. So think about focusing on how to do it right, what's the right process, and also getting all the details, making sure that before they make a decision to move forward, they get all the details. Well, as you can guess, there are inherent conflicts possible with differing approaches because of differing personalities. But for the sake of what we're talking about right now, let's set those aside Let's set the personality traits aside for a while and consider urgency from a more holistic perspective. I want you to think of urgency, and I'm again, I'm talking healthy urgency. You know, that that internal desire to get things done and to do them in a timely manner. Now, timely is kind of up to the individual or up to the needs of whatever needs to be accomplished if there are deadlines. But think about urgency uh, as a driving force to provide the motivation and energy to complete things within a specific time frame. Not at the expense of wellness or balance in your life, but simply as an internal or intrinsic motivator. There's a myth that if you have too much urgency, then you're a type A person and it's not necessarily a good thing. Well, that's not what I'm talking about at all. You can have a sense of urgency and you can treat healthy urgency as a competency that you grow and develop. So where does it come from? Where does that healthy urgency come from? There's actually a sequence that I use to describe this. It starts with your beliefs and your values. 
So your beliefs and values are some of the the core things about you. They're really deep down, uh, strongly held beliefs and values. From that, what you are passionate about is generated. And that makes sense. If you have a belief or a value around something and you feel strongly about it, there are probably going to be certain things you're passionate about. Well, what does that do when you become passionate? Well, it drives emotional drivers. It generates emotional drivers. And those then generate your self-talk. And out of that, out of that sequence, you get your decisions and you get the actions you're going to take. That is a process by which we can see what motivates us, what is our passion, and that is where healthy urgency comes from. I would bet if you stop for a minute and think about all of the things on your to-do list, and whether it's at work or at home, doesn't make any difference. My guess is there are a few of those that you feel more motivated to get done than others. And that's where healthy urgency is kicking in because there's something you're more passionate about. You want to make sure you complete over other things. And a lot of times that's how we set our priorities. Now, is that the right way to do things? That's really up to you and the needs of those things that need to get done. I mean, if we don't do the things that have deadlines at work, that's probably not a good place to be either. So that's where we come back to what's going on with healthy urgency. Where where is it being diminished? So we talked about that sequence that generates the energy and the motivation to get things done and drives basically the level of healthy urgency that you're going to have. So is this something that happens organically or can you intentionally change this? The answer is actually both. The things you have passion for will generate the motivation that you need to give you the energy and the direction and the impetus to get things done. Your self-talk then becomes the affirmation and the encouragement that you need to make those decisions and take those actions. So if you look at urgency as a competency, something that we can become passionate about, then we demystify what urgency is and we can actually use it as a strategic resource. It's not something that takes over our lives or lessens our social skills. It actually enhances our soft skills because it moves us to communicate better with other people, to interact better with others, just to be more efficient in how we lead others or collaborate with others. Can some people take urgency too far? Sure, absolutely. However, when that happens... It is highly likely it shows up in one of the negative forms of urgency, fear, frustration, anxiety, stress, all of those things we've talked about before. But I want to stay focused on the positive. Let's continue to focus in on using healthy urgency and even growing and developing it as a competency. So why is healthy urgency diminishing? Well, recent research has brought to light some very concerning facts. Let me walk you through a few of these. The world is facing a human energy crisis, both at home and at work. What does that mean? Well, well well-being scores continue to decline. Rates of burnout, social isolation and even emotional detachment are at all-time highs. 
higher than they have ever been. And what's happening is these issues are hitting younger generations even harder than older generations. This is draining people of their energy. So no wonder healthy urgency is suffering. Here's another fact. The pandemic shut a lot of things down. Many, 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 many businesses went out of business. They went bankrupt. Kids couldn't go to school. Parents didn't know what to do. It created this massive uncertainty that just hung over everybody like a black cloud. And what happens, and and there's a statement. This came out of the Gallup, the mood of the world study. And there's a statement in there that just, that just really struck me when, when I read it. Let me read it to you. This new state of uncertainty grinds the life out of people a little bit every day. And I think that's exactly right. Think about when you have uncertainty. It just grinds away at you. It grinds away at me. And it it drains my energy, my focus. I lose time doing things. takes longer to do things than it normally does. So in that same study, they found that roughly 7 out of 10 or 70% of people are either struggling or they're suffering. 7 out of 10 people. Here's another fact. Because of all of this that's been going on, 53% of employees are saying, we're going to prioritize our health and our well-being over our work. There's nothing wrong with that, but it changes the workplace dynamic. And that's something, it, it's another change. It's more uncertainty. And it, it frankly, it's a new model. And organizations tend to run on models that they're used to, and they weren't used to this new model. The last thing I want to share with you, and something very serious, 53% of managers or leaders report feeling burned out at work. That came out of the Microsoft Work Trend Index annual report. Burnout is a very serious issue. It isn't just I'm tired or I don't have any energy at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Burnout is no hope. Things are not going to get better. I'm not making a difference. Nothing's ever going to change. I'm stuck. I hate it. I don't want to go to work. You start hearing yourself saying some of those things. Seriously consider talking to somebody about it. And it doesn't have to be a mental health professional right away. Talk to somebody you trust. Let them talk to you if they know you well about have they seen a change in you. And then if you need to speak to a mental health professional, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Don't get hung up in this this status thing or this myth of, oh, if I do that, I'm weak. Or if I do that, I can't handle it myself. Or, oh my gosh, if somebody found out about it, stop it. That's just nonsense. You've got to take care of yourself. And bottom line, if you're a leader or a manager, you know, I'm going to use the analogy, if you're on an airplane and the oxygen masks drop down, what do they tell you to do? Put it on yourself first and then you can help other people. Well, same thing if you're a leader or manager. Help yourself first so you can help your other people. Because 7 out of 10 of those people are struggling or suffering. These are very sobering insights. But it really helps us understand the impact all of these things are having on people. And then it just affirms why there is a decline in healthy urgency. 
So let me try to outline that point by point. Things you can look at, things that you can kind of hold on to. Number one, people are fatigued. They're tired. Change fatigue, stress fatigue, uncertainty fatigue, economic pressure fatigue. Number two, the increased demands on people are draining their energy and their focus. Number three, major life events like the pandemic have altered people's lives and their habits. And that habit thing is really important. We'll talk about that more. Number four, remote work has become the preferred way of working for a large portion of the workforce. And this has introduced new challenges, new distractions, and frankly, the need for new models. People are not as excited about coming into the office anymore, at least a a large portion of the workforce. That changes things. It doesn't mean it's bad, but it means now we need to figure out how to come together and make it work so that we can get the work done that we need to get done. And the distractions are a real thing. I talk to a lot of people in my coaching that are at home. They may have kids at home or pets or whatever. And I, there are several times during a coaching session where they will be distracted because of that. Well, that's going to continue throughout the day and continue throughout their work. So it's really hard to have a sense of healthy urgency when the distractions are constant. And unless you have real discipline and have set up your workplace remotely to minimize those distractions, it's a very real thing. Number five, employees are juggling more than ever before. Number six, leaders and managers are asked to do more, be more, and accomplish more with less resources. Well, no wonder there's a declining sense of healthy urgency. With 53% of managers in burnout and 70% of the population struggling or suffering, who has any energy left to get things done with any sense of urgency? But some people are still operating in a highly efficient manner. They really do have a significant amount of healthy urgency to get things done. How are they doing that? Okay, let me share some secrets about how to leverage this healthy urgency competency we're talking about. I want you to think about a habit you would like to change, but you've struggled with changing it. What have you tried to change that habit? What have you tried in the past? And if it isn't changed by now, it probably didn't work, right? So think about what have you tried? Why didn't that work? Why do New Year's resolutions fail uh, the majority of the time? Well, the answer is really more simple than you might think. And we're getting to a step-by-step approach here to understand how to get that healthy sense of urgency through changing our habits. But first, I have to define what's going on so you can understand habits are not just things that happen for no reason. There is, there's purpose and intentionality behind habits. We would not have habits if they did not at some time in our life give us some type of reward. I mean, that's just common sense, right? Well, let's break this down. We all have productive and counterproductive habits. Makes sense, right? I mean, that's just common sense. But here's something most people don't know. When we engage in developing ourselves, growing ourselves, 
through whatever process we use, both productive and counterproductive habits are boosted. Now, I know that sounds maybe counterintuitive, but it really does happen that way. When you go out to a, a, a seminar or a workshop and you learn new things, and you get really excited about it and all of that, you're not just boosting productive habits. You're also boosting counterproductive habits because they're already in place. They're already a pattern or from a neurobiology perspective, a neural pathway that you've created that's already there. And so when you get excited and, and learn new things and all of that, both of those are ignited and boosted. So what happens? And I know that sounds crazy, right? It is true, though. The more we try to improve ourselves, both productive and counterproductive habits are strengthened. What happens then is the counterproductive habits drag the productive habits down, which results in no real gain. Does that mean don't try to grow and develop? Absolutely not. The key, though, is to reduce the counterproductive habits first. If you'd like to explore that further, I have done another episode on what is your habit story. And that'll talk all about a way to measure those habits, both productive and counterproductive, and and talk about what you can do with that. So am I saying that counterproductive habits are blocking healthy urgency? Absolutely, yes. That's what I'm saying. What I have not yet mentioned is that our habits have strong emotional drivers attached to them. Think of a time you wanted to change something, but then had a feeling that derailed you from making that change. And most of the time, New Year's resolutions or just this commitment to change a habit, most of the time what gets in the way is the emotional drivers or detractors that hit you and derail you from focusing in on changing that. It's too hard. It's not worth it. You know, and that, remember, after the emotional drivers are generated, your self-talk kicks in. And so if you, if you hear yourself saying things like, it's not worth it. It's too much work. I, I don't have time for that right now. Those are the kinds of self-talk derailers that will really hurt when you want to make a change. Let me share a story with you for just a minute. I was talking to somebody recently who was concerned about their pipeline of prospects for their business. They told me where they were. They gave me five things they needed to do to enhance their prospect pipeline. These are the same five things that they have told me for the last 12 months. We spent some time exploring this again, and I asked several questions. Now, I have a process I use where I ask a series of questions, which is, I I do this five times, to get to the heart of an issue. So the first question I start with is, when you think and then fill in the blank. So for instance, in this case, it would be when you think I'm worried about my prospect pipeline, um, how do you feel about it and what do you do about it? And then I want to hear what that person says. How do they feel about that worry, that concern, that anxiety they're feeling? And what do they do next? What happens next? Now, after they answer that, the next four questions are exactly the same question after they've given their answer, which is, then what do you do? And I repeat this, as I said, four different times. It really helps to peel back the layers of the onion to get to the core of what's going on with someone, because it's easy to get lost in the mess and the fog, 
But if you keep drilling down, keep peeling those layers of the onion back, eventually you're going to find the root cause. Now, it's amazing how effective this is, by the way. In every case, what was keeping him stuck were emotional detractors that kept strengthening his counterproductive habits. So let me give you an example of what that is. Oh, if I change that, it might mess this up over here. And I don't feel good about that. So he's not going to try and make the change because that emotional driver of uncertainty has created a derailer for him, so he's not going to move forward with the change. This is a clear case where healthy urgency has diminished so things are not getting done to improve the situation. So many people resign themselves to a reality that could be changed, but will not be until the counterproductive habits are diminished. I want to take a minute and just share some insights for leaders. What do we do with all of this? And again, I believe we're all leaders. I don't care who you are that's listening to this. We lead ourselves first, and then we lead other people, even if it's just by influence or example. Whatever your role is, developing healthy urgency as a strategic competency has many benefits. Unfortunately, most leaders I talk to do not see this in their workplace. They don't see very much healthy urgency in their workplace. If we want that to change, we have to be intentional. So here's a few steps that we can take. Number one, leaders first. Practice healthy urgency as a leader and as an aspect of getting things done and then celebrate the wins when they happen. Set the example for your team, for your people. Number two, don't assume your people know what you expect. It is your job to ensure they understand expectations the same way that you do. And that is a huge pitfall for most leaders. Even if somebody nods their head or they say, yeah, I understand or whatever, that's not enough. Do they understand it the same way that you understand it? All of the implications, all of the potential outcomes, do they really truly understand those expectations? Number three, if you or your people exhibit symptoms of burnout, do something about it. It will not resolve on its own. Number four, develop emotional intelligence skills to become more agile and more resilient. Then help people build those in your team. Help them to grow their emotional intelligence skills. Number five, leaders need to be learners. That is critical in today's fast-changing and dynamic workplace. And I'm going to have more on this in the near future that we'll talk about. Healthy urgency, just like other skills and competencies, can be enhanced and it can be increased. First, we need to remove the counterproductive habits that are holding us back. Then we can be more intentional and effective in getting where you want to go, getting things done that you really want to get done and getting them done in a timely manner. That is something to be urgent about. Thank you for joining us for this episode. If you have any questions about this week's episode or maybe a suggestion for future episodes you'd like us to explore, please contact us through our website at eqfit.org. For more information and inspiration, connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube at EQFit.